Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the trade war between China and the United States and the state of the global trade. To do this, we have with us Rajat Nag, who has been an observer on the economic issues for a long time, also with the ADB earlier, and Vishwajit Dhar, who teaches economics in the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Not the best of places at the moment currently, but leaving that out. Rajat, let's start with you. No let up on the China-US uh, trade uh, sanctions against each other that we can see? Well, since these decisions are being taken very irrationally, uh, I would have to say that I'm afraid we don't know. There is no economic rationale for what's happening on And it started both. with Trump And it started with Trump for totally sort of, you know, political, personal reasons. Uh, but it's hurting both. And of course, in the short run, it perhaps will hurt China a bit more. But U.S. is not coming out of it unscathed at all. But the problem in this is that it is not a rational decision being taken by, say, the U.S. And China, my own feeling would be, would have been better off not reacting. Uh, they have, in that sense, played into the U.S. hands, this tit for tat. But I can understand why they had to do it too. Yeah, but the answer to your question, I think this will continue for a while. And the next presidential election in the U.S. will probably be this marker at which things hopefully would improve if it's not Mr. Trump. Yeah, uh, let's sort of not <coughs> predict the U.S. <coughs> elections, but more than that, the U.S. hardening towards, the, uh, towards China is appearing to be across the board. And in fact, even the other side, quote unquote, the Democratic side, is also coming out very hard against China. And it seems to be something which strategic as well as economic interests are trying to now combine to say long term we need to disengage from China because they really are our glo global competitor and that's what the long term threat is. I think we should parse it into two, two segments. At one level, yes, you're absolutely right. But that was the US position for a long time, seeing the China as a threat and also sometimes as a strategic partner, seeing it as a competition and seeing it as a rival. So in that sense, there was always this tension. And of course, bottom line is that China as a rising power challenging the authority of the only superpower. Those tensions were always there and playing out. But I think what was happening in previous administrations, there was a strategic view that if China is a rival, how do we contain it? How do we play with it? How do we not play with it? What has happened with this administration in the US, all of those strategic issues have gone out the window, or at least are not playing as important a part. Therefore, the overlay of these personal emotional things are coming into play. It's a it. collision course which has been And it's said. a collision course which <clears throat> has come into play. You know, Vishujit, I would like to also uh, ask you about what is its impact for the larger trade scenario in the world? Because just as Trump seems to have launched, shall we say, various strikes against the Chinese in trade sanctions and other spheres, there is also this issue that he has hamstrung the WTO completely. And he is setting basically the unilateral demand that all countries which have adverse trade balance with the United States has to balance the deficits while others with whom U.S. has a positive balance, of course, there is no question of doing that there. Do you think that the WTO hamstringing plus the kind of sanctions that has been done on the United States, uh, by the, on China, not China alone, but also the European Union is being threatened. It is also trade sanctions even against, even against other ally, allies that uh, the U.S. has been doing. Of course, India being mm. one of them or wannabe allies, which Mr. Modi seems to want to be, as we saw in Howdy Modi. So how do you see this part of it playing out? No, I think, uh, you know, uh, Trump's uh, assault, I would say, against the WTO is, uh, again, um, uh, hurting him as well. Um, he has uh, dealt uh, a, a body blow to the multilateral uh, trading system. The entire rules-based system is, is now in serious jeopardy, uh, and especially because, um, you know, uh, the appellate body, which is virtually non-existent, uh, will be non-existent um, actually Come on December. the 11th of December. But it's actually, you know, um, almost almost gone now. 
uh, was uh, the critical uh, you know body which was responsible for enforcing all the disciplines that countries or the commitments countries had taken uh, as a part of being a member of the WTO. And that's going to be in a coma because US is not letting a judge be appointed. A trial. That is right. So so uh, now at, at this point we have two uh, appellate, uh, they have three appellate body members uh, and, and for any uh, uh, panel to be formed you need three, three judges. And, and two of them are, are, are will be retiring on, on 10th of December. So from 11th of December, you'll have only one uh, uh, appellate body member left, which means that, you know, the, pan, the appellate body can't meet and, and therefore they cannot uh, adjudicate on the findings of the panel, the dispute settlement panel. And unless, uh, and, uh, and, and the, fi the, the findings of the appellate body uh, was uh, is is, fin is final and binding on all the members, which means that essentially no dispute settlement uh, procedure would really exist in terms of a resolution through the WTO. That is right. No, let me let me clarify. You know, there will be dispute settlement <coughs> panels, but the the panel, the decision of the panels are 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 not binding on the members. So only it's when they only go when to the appeal, go appeal, and and then the appellate body gives a ruling, and that is why when it becomes effective. Now, the interesting part of this whole story is that it's not that the U.S. has backed off from, uh, you know, register or uh, filing cases against, uh, you know, uh, Others. other members. So, so this, uh, you know, the demise of the appellate body is also going to hurt the U.S. because the U.S. also will find that it is not able to use uh, the, the, the WTO uh, for its own purposes. So now, you know, they've actually shot them themselves also on the foot. You know, of course, both of you are saying that. I could argue that the United States has outlived, according to itself, the utility of WTO for its own benefits. And yes, of course, it will also have some uh, adverse effects, as you say. But on the whole, it will benefit is what they believe. And I do not somehow see that there is Trump or the U.S. shooting itself on the foot having harmed the U.S. economy because the U.S. economy seems to be doing quite well at the moment. That's what at least <coughs> Trump, Mr. Trump says. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that is absolutely correct because, you know, the U.S. economy is also uh, feeling the pinch. and uh, you know, But it has low unemployment rate at the moment. At, at this point, it yes. has. It has reasonable growth at this moment, unless things go really all right in the next three months or there's a war in West Asia, which could happen. Then, of course, everybody goes down the tube. The recession hasn't hit the U.S. So why do you say the U.S. is fairly feeling the pain? No, I think probably take it from the other side. One thing that has happened with the Trump administration, because they are presenting all of this in such an adversarial, rhetorical, rude whatever words you might want to use. But if you look at the attitude of the U.S. towards WTO, previously was not that friendly. I mean, they did think that the rules-based system was not something they would want to abide by, as Bishri says, when it didn't suit them. But it was done within a certain framework of diplomacy, of certain framework of international rules and multilateralism. No, we have agreed. Okay. The Trump but, has so been very crude. Yeah, but therefore, it's not as if, in a sense, the Trump administration's comments sort of suddenly sort of changed everything, which was very different before. What has happened is, is exacerbated A and B, as Bishwit quite rightly says, they, I think, do not necessarily see anything in the long-term strategic interest of the U.S. itself. So the trade war, for example, or its views about WTO is not going to help the U.S. in the long run. As a matter of fact, U.S. is much better off in a multilateral setting than not. To your point about the economy, I think it is true the U.S. economy is doing well, but a large part of it is something that reforms had started much earlier. And secondly, the big tax cuts which have come, pushed the consumption, etc. So time will tell whether the economy in the U.S. is fundamentally strong and robust. But the trade war they've started with, the US, with China is going to hurt them. It is actually hurting them. You don't see them in the macro numbers as yet. But I think you'll start to see them. And the economy is going to start to slow down. So what, no, what no, yeah. let me also let me also uh, you know uh, see one wa see one of the concerns that um, American economists have is that uh, uh, the the tax cuts that Trump mm. had mm. offered 
uh, they haven't actually re resulted in higher investments. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the whole right. uh, narrative that Trump had actually uh, sold while uh, you know, cutting the taxes was that now, you know, I'm actually doing this favor to these big guys and they in turn will do me the favor by raising uh, you know, investments. investments. <coughs> they have not. Because, yeah, they haven't. Because, you know, the... Uh, you know, um, this is this is the grand plan that you uh, the that uh, Trump has. You know, the 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 whole make America great again and 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 uh, and and uh, uh, start start rolling of uh, the 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 rust belt. Yeah, now, that is not happening. So you are co absolutely correct that whatever happened happened during the Obama administration. I, and I would say that part of it was also uh, you know the effect of the palm priming that happened after the uh, recession. Right. So all that has actually happened after a lag, and is as is right. as is usual, and and therefore you know what we are seeing is the, is the fag end of that you know mm. that push so, that happened. So what back. both of you are saying essentially is that this is going to bite in the medium term, may yes. not show itself in the short term because this kind of economic changes that right. take place right. do not show itself immediately. Right. And the second point that both of you made, which also applies to India, for instance, is that when you give capitalists more uh, freedom to keep their money, whether they'll invest or not depends on the state of the economy. That means, are people going to buy? All of that takes into account whether they right. will invest or not, not just because they have got more money, because yeah. there are other avenues of spending that no, money in, in the or US, investing in no, the money. In, in the US, it's, it's also slightly different because, you know, the, the capitalists had actually got used to not investing in US. Uh, yeah. they, they're investing so, all over the so place. That, that's exactly what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Therefore, and they have financial channels, which does not necessarily mean investing domestically in that's the right. industry. And that's why, is you know, you find Trump coming back uh, regularly and telling these guys, you know, you come back and invest here. So I'm not, I'm not actually helping you to go go to China, go to wherever, but you come and invest here. So, 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 uh, you know, the the, the long term behavior of American capital, which is that they are not actually investing in the U.S. and still they, continues, and that 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 still continues and, because the invest, yeah, investment and, rates. And I would just extend by saying it's nothing to do with American capital per se, any capital. I mean, you're talking about basic That's theory of comparative advantage. You're talking about the benefits of globalization. And you can't have it both ways. You can't talk about the benefits of globalization and then say invest domestically. But, Ro Roger, you know, the fundamental issue that the United States has is that I'm exceptional. So all of you have to follow, by, follow these rules. But I want to have my cake and eat it too. And this is exactly what Mr. Trump is really telling everybody. Yeah, but... Again, I mean, you know, I would say that uh, it would be natural for anybody to want to do that. If I have the power, I'll use it. Now, you know, but China what saying is they or don't have US, the power now. they know the power now. That's the point. So it's not as if it's the U.S. saying it, which would be different than the Europeans saying it or the Chinese saying it. They are saying it because they think they can actually enforce it. I think the point that Vishwajit and I are both making, mm -hmm. that you can't. You can't defy some of the fundamental principles of economics for too long. You can do it for a period, but it doesn't work. And you cannot do it against, at the moment, rising uh, technical prowess in different parts of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And actually a failing American infrastructure and economy. Right. Because investments, the flip side of giving capital all of this uh, largesse, which is what successive American governments have given, is also that you don't invest in infrastructure, right. you don't right. invest in roads. Right. Right. You have to only see when you go to United States right. and to right. China, the differential investment taking place in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And right. if you wanted to do prime priming of the pump, as mm. you talked mm. about, mm. one of the easy ways would have been to invest in the infrastructure. Right. And instead right. of that, you have given really largest right. of the capital. But this is part of the you know, larger story that we have discussed on several occasions on your show, Prabir, and that is basically the center of gravity of the economic power certainly shifting eastwards. And that's what we are seeing. So there are a large number of you know, issues at play, but the fundamental one is that the economic power is gradually moving east, and Asia, in particular, will account for almost half the global GDP in another about you know thirty years. Well, that's yeah. what it used to do for a very long time. Yeah. Right, go and back it, to what it yeah. was. and it is also half the world's population. Well, and so I think that, that is the surprising. fundamental problem that uh, Trump is is battling with. He knows very well 
that you know the you know the the center of gravity the has has moved away right and 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 he's trying his best to get it back to where it was right. maybe maybe right. for for three decades you back you know the question simply is that with bluff bluster and the big stick how far can you stop as uh, it was said can you stop the waves and this is really what is now happening post colonialism mm -hmm that with independence of these economies there is a growth mm. and we are seeing the reassertion of people finally becoming the economy and you can arrest it temporarily you can as you said by uh, stronger measures temporarily try and arrest it which may be possible for one two three years but, but if you look in the long right. term not no, but and that's what we really no, see no another another thing which is happening very interest or has happened already uh, you know today uh, uh trump has become the the, the biggest protectionist yeah. of course so three three decades back this whole process of globalization started in washington the washington consensus today the driver of globalization is beijing so i think you know we were discussing somewhere else that i think we should now rename this as a, as beijing consensus the new wave of you know so sort of economic integration that has started so washington consensus is passe washington has gone completely protectionist and the new wave of integration will come come from from the east uh, like you said that you know uh, the the whole center of gravity is, has moved in more ways than one right so it also means that who has the technol technological lead not right now but in the future that will also change some of sure. these terms that sure. we are talking sure. about and we are seeing a passing of an age and beginning of a new age perhaps and this is the attempt by an aging power to yeah. still keep its dominance to other means and that seems to be what explains trump thank you very much rajat and vishwajit for being with us and also we hope that we'll be here to see how this pans out whether trump loses or wins the next election thank you very much this is all the time we have for news click today do keep watching news click and also visit our website Thank <laughs> you.